Howdy! This screencast is to help you annotate Ted Hughes's poem, Fulbright Scholars. This poem is the first poem set for study by Nessa in Hughes's section of Module A, Textual Conversations. But it's also the conveniently very first poem in his actual anthology titled Birthday Letters, published in 1998, just months before his death. The collection of poetry is dedicated to Plath and Hughes's two children, Frida and Nicholas. So birthday letters broke the silence of Hughes and he was able to lay bare the private life of his relationship to Sylvia Plath and to the public. The media and scholars alike were somewhat obsessed with the infamous couple and scrutinized their poetry line by line and their relationship uncovering lie by lie. John Burgess from the Washington Post actually wrote an article when the poetry uh, was first published in 1998, saying that Hughes makes no apology to those in the literary world who hold him partly responsible for Plath's death. So instead, uh, Hughes's poetry speaks of how her work evolved. It describes some of her more lovable habits, but it does also deal with her draining battle against her emotional instability. Now, contextually speaking, the poetry is his only published chronicle of his marriage to Plath, but he still did release some poetry and publish some poetry before that. But uh, Birthday Letters is situated in a time in the 90s where there were rising tensions between the media and truth. These cultural disputes over public and private lives continued to move audiences as they understand how the media both reveals and conceals information from them. We're looking very much at a time where the media had power um, to distort truth, but also um, in their unfathomable ability to convey a, a type of truth and search for a narrative. Contemporary academic uh, Sarah Churchill actually put it best in her thesis from 2001 when she wrote about birthday letters. She says that the poetry anthology birthday letters can be best understood as an open secret a volume hesitating uneasily between disclosure and encryption. So Hughes's memory of Plath are partly a response to the problems of publicity, but nevertheless, he attempts to navigate the boundaries between the public and private worlds. The poem in front of you, Fulbright Scholars, recounts the time when Plath came to England on a Fulbright scholarship at the University of Cambridge. The poem describes the first sight of his future wife, but there's a detachment from her. He hasn't necessarily uh, met her yet. But his use of the first person pronoun embraces this sense of nostalgia. And it's very fitting that it's the very first poem situated in his work. <clears throat> okay, on to annotating. All right, well, first thing you need to know about uh, Fulbright scholars is to understand what a Fulbright scholar is. So. Um, the Fulbright program is the flagship international educational exchange program that's sponsored by the US government. So you're basically bringing, um, like it's, it's designed to increase mutual understanding between countries. So you're bringing, you know, the American of Plath into uh, the United Kingdom, um, obviously celebrating their intellect um, and her prowess in poetry. Okay, so she earned herself one of these scholarships. And this is pretty much how Hughes and her met, because Hughes was working at the University of Cambridge um, when she first came there on the Fulbright Scholarship. Okay, now you know a little bit about the title. Let's have a look uh, line by line throughout the poem. Well, just looking, looking at it from kind of um, externally speaking, the poem is filled with lots of truncated sentences to evoke a, like kind of snippets of memory. So you can see that there are like each kind of line, some lines within here are short, are sharp, um, that they're small, they're small sentences. And then we also get an immediate understanding of the setting of this poem. So the very first line, where was it in the Strand? It sets up the fact that where we are in London, because the Strand is a street. Okay, in London. So he, he definitely places us as the reader and the persona somewhere into, into his world um, in London. So he asks and, and starts the poem, where was it? In the Strand. He begins with this rhetorical question, right? He recounts a memory of the first time that he may have ever seen Plath or, or questions even if he did. 
like I said before, the Strand is a street in London. And basically the question is him trying to recollect a memory, right? It's an experience for him, not an exact meeting of her, but a time where he can perhaps remember either seeing her or, or you know, kind of like an abstract memory, an abstract notion. He says, a display of news items in photographs. For some reason, I noticed it. All right, so he's established setting, but he's also established the fact that um, he is somewhere on the strand looking at a newspaper or something like that, and there's a particular photo of all these years or that, that year's Fulbright scholars. He gives us the first person pronoun, okay? So he's kind of he's showing us that he's unsure of things, but also the, this first person pronoun is different for Hughes's style because he doesn't usually write with in first person. So we can definitely take this as a personal, um, more kind of emotional approach, I suppose, to talking about his late wife, Sylvia Plath. It's got a picture of that year's intake of Fulbright scholars, just arriving or arrived, or some of them. Okay, well, like I told you before, I gave you sort of the definition of um, what a Fulbright scholar is, and he's, he's making a direct reference here, so the scholarship program. He's, he's acknowledging her intellect in being able to someone who can get into um, the Fulbright scholarship. And then he's also, like there's a lot of kind of low modality. He's thinking through his thoughts. For some reason I noticed it. So that's low modality because we're, we're unsure, okay, or he or the persona is unsure. He's even got this little dash here, just arriving or arrived. And that's meant to kind of symbolise, I suppose, that, that we take a pause as we're reading the poem, but also that um, he he's kind of questioning his memories, right, as we're going through the poem. He's got the repetition of arrived and arriving here. So he's repeating arrives, but this enforces his memory, something that is particularly fleeting, so only recalled through particular parts somewhat like you know an unreliable narrator and, and the use of the low modality here is trying to show us this unreliable nature of him he says or some of them were you among them now and when he's questioning this little part here were you among them he's asking another rhetorical question right so he continues to question the truth when he first met plath he's unsure when he did he says i studied it not too minutely, wondering which of them I might meet. Well, the interesting part about um, their history here is that their, their meeting was going to be inevitable because Plath had already known about Hughes. She'd followed some of his work. She wanted to meet him. So she was aware of him and she would have done anything possible and, and a lot of the uh, academics and um, people close to her have come out in her biographies and autobiographies, etc saying that she knew about Hughes. Okay, so there's this sense of inevitability between them. But he's reflecting about it and talking about it, obviously, in the 90s. He says, I remember that thought. So here's probably one of the first times where we get this um, like high modality. This is the thing he does remember. He's definitive in this, in this moment. And the thought that he remembers is wondering which of them he might meet. Okay. He goes, not your face. No doubt I scanned particularly the girls. Well, we finally get a, finally get a little introduction here to his uh, admission of his wandering eye, okay, of Hugh's, um, you know, dallying with females, etc. particularly because he was teaching at university, um, which is also how he met Plath. So he is being kind of open and honest here. No doubt I scanned particularly the girls. Right, looking for looking for someone, looking for someone interesting, looking for someone special. But then he meets us back with the with the maybe. Maybe I noticed you, maybe I weighed you up, feeling unlikely. So you've got that repetition there again of the maybes, but this time again it's used to sort of um make him unreliable. Okay. He says, noted your long hair, loose waves, your Veronica Lake Bang. All right, well, this is a direct historical allusion to Veronica Lake. She was basically this kind of glamorous, beautiful actress in the, in the 1940s, and she starred in a lot of film noir pictures, okay, so black and white kind of crime detective 
uh, style films. And this illusion here refers to the sweep of Veronica Lake's hair that hangs across her face. And sometimes it, it obscured one eye, all right, and, or it obscured some of her vision. So there's, there are kind of literal and physical similar similarities here between Veronica Lake and Sylvia Plath. We look at the idea that maybe both have got something to hide, okay, both are kind of in this um, black and white, like dark, darker world with the film noir stuff versus, you know, Sylvia Plath's kind of emotional um, and psychological instability. But again, there's kind of a mystery about her. He noted your hair, the loose waves, your Veronica Lake bang. He's very specific because he meets that with not what it hid. It would appear blonde. So he does acknowledge that there is something behind her, something something a little bit, I suppose, more menacing or unexplainable um, that, that was difficult for him to understand. And then he kind of keeps talking about her a little bit more. He says, it would appear blonde and your grin, note the truncated sentences here, your exaggerated American grin for the cameras, the judges, the strangers, the frighteners. Well, each of these links here, uh, we're looking at a technique of anaphora or you can just talk about repetition with the cameras, the judges, the strangers, the frighteners. But the anaphora that's used here, it's more cynical about his positioning on Plath. He's talking about a typical kind of boisterous, over-the-top, dramatic American. But he's presenting a vision of her acting for appearance's sake, right, about her grin for others, for the cameras, for judges, all these onlookers watching on. It could also be perhaps a little dig at, at, the, at the public, I suppose, and their ability to scrutinise the couple. Um, but I, I think it's interesting that this is probably one of the longest, um, this is one of the longest lines in the poem, which is mostly kind of written in, uh, written in free verse. But he continues on, then I forgot, yet I remember the picture, the Fulbright scholars. All right, well, he brings us back to this moment where, you know, he's looking at an image, okay, of all the Fulbright scholars or the people that got the Fulbright scholarships. So he, can't, he brings us back. He says, with their luggage? It seems unlikely, but they have come as a team. Well, there's an accumulation here kind of of rhetorical questions that he's asking, again, supporting that, that unreliable um, nature of his work um, and particularly, you know, trying to recollect a memory about perhaps when he first saw Plath without even knowing who she was going to be later. He says, I was walking sore-footed under hot sun and hot pavements. Well, his sections here, he's giving us a lot of tactile imagery. So Hughes, he dismantles the memory and basically brings us back now to his current, like his memory that he had on the day by presenting us with these tactile images. So things that he could touch and things that he could feel. So we're walking back along the strand and this highlights the feelings and, and the senses that are associated with this memory. He His style is very much to look at experience and be able to, um, talk about in his poetry how how certain experiences made him feel and that kind of visceral uh, experience helps readers tap into uh, his world and his life and his topic and content um, that he has in his poetry. Then he asks another question, was it then I bought a peach? Well, if you know T.S. Eliot, you might, um, you might have heard this line before. But it come, it, this intertextual reference here comes from T.S. Eliot's poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Now, in T.S. Eliot's work, the line that he uses is, do I dare read a peach? So here, Hughes has kind of appropriated that, um, that question, um, instead changing it to, was it then I bought a peach? And both of the poems, like T.S. Eliot's Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock and Ted Hughes's Fulbright Scholars, both of these deal with elements of reflection, okay? Both of them actually look at a person kind of walking and delving in and out of their memories, okay? So they've got a lot of similarities and, and intertextuality really works like that to bring a new kind of a new meeting or a new purpose or a new um, association with an experience. The, both of the poems also deal with the jarring moments of history so that that memories are quick, they're fleeting, they're not always linear in some 
capacity, which is probably why he uses a lot of low modality as well in his poetry. He says, that's, a, that's as I remember, from a stall near Charing Cross Station, so he brings us back now to, to where he is next to a stall in Charing Cross Station. He says, it was the first peach I had ever tasted. I could hardly believe how delicious. At 25, I was dumbfounded afresh by my ignorance of the simplest things. Well, these last four lines are quite beautiful. He's giving us a lot of sensory imagery at the end here. So if we had the tactile imagery before about the sore foot under hot sun, hot pavements, now he's giving us about some gustatory imagery, right? So taste. And his reference to the peach is refreshing for the persona, like who, who's going on this walk. It's also relatable for us in understanding kind of that, that memories are fleeting, that they happen um, kind of sporadically. The poem moves from a position of uncertainty and doubt back then to the very end here to a position of like discovery of something serendipitous or something solid like the peach or what he remembers. That's as I remember. Okay, these are the certainties now that he can recall about Sylvia Plath. So the tone very much at the end here, by my ignorance of the simplest things, I think the tone is one of hindsight. And now he could be referring to a lot of things, He whether referring to his ignorance surrounding Plath's intensity or their marriage and their breakdown, could be referring to the public outcry or even the vilification of Hughes himself. But we have to work with just, you know, interpreting what Hughes puts in front of us. So we will never know 100%. But I suppose my ignorance of the simplest things is that a lot of Hughes's world and a lot of his relationship with Plath and a lot of their contexts aren't necessarily simple. And you can't ignore their desire and their inevitability as a couple and their poetry and what it expresses. So we just have to speculate and use the poem as a way to support what we want to say. Right, hopefully that gives you some annotations and some knowledge on Ted Hughes's poem, Fulbright Scholars. Thanks very much. Bye.